I have one um, big question that I think yeah. everybody would like the answer to, which is to what extent do you think there's life outside uh, uh, Earth mm. um, or not on Earth? And when people hear this, they think aliens, but you know, like an insect-like creature, a uh, single or small multi-cell organism on another planet, that, that itself yeah. would be a spectacular find. Well, yeah, I'm kind of an outlier. So just uh, everyone should, you know, look to the actual experts in this field. But I have some rigorous, you know, kind of logical arguments that I believe the probability of life, I never say it's zero, but I think it's very low. And I, I think I can substantiate that. And the best part is I can't be falsified right now. There's zero evidence that there's life anywhere else in the universe, period, full stop, end of sentence. There's no evidence, conclusive evidence. In fact, Lots of drones over New Jersey right now, not <laughs> no evidence of life anywhere Knew we'd else. get into drones. Um, uh, so the, the argument that it would somehow, first of all, transform our understanding of human place is inarguable to me. I, I believe that's true. Although in, um, in this movie, Contact, is a really wonderful movie. Uh, it's not cheesy science fiction. It was the first to like use a wormhole and all sorts of cool stuff as contrivances. But in that movie, there's a scene where President Bill Clinton is talking about the discovery that this fictitious character made. But he's actually talking about a meteorite that was discovered in Antarctica. And they just clipped that and the meteorite was believed to have microbial life, and that meteorite's origin was in, inarguably from Mars, okay? So the reasoning was, this is 1997, that there was a meteorite found on, in Antarctica where it's easy to find meteorites. Is there's it in a, the movie or in real life? It's in real life. In okay. 1997, a scientist announced the discovery of a meteorite from Antarctica. It's called Allen Land Hills Meteorite. And it had what they claimed were evidence of microbial life and even respiration byproducts of these microbial life forms, okay? It was such a big deal that within minutes, you know, Bill Clinton had a press conference on the White House lawn where he goes, this rock speaks to us from across the generations. And if confirmed, will undoubtedly, you know, uh, revolutionize our understanding of the universe around, okay? Now, the movie clips that clip to make it seem like Ellie, the fictitious character, discovered a, like, mm. You know, this SETI, extraterrestrial technology, not a microbe. But in the public's mind, that actual scientific discovery was never uh, falsified. It was certainly never confirmed. No one's ever come back to say that was correct and that we did find microbial evidence of microbial life on Mars. Now, how did that meteorite get there? Well, uh, some asteroids hit the moon. That's why it has craters on it. It hits the Earth, that's why we have uh, Meteor Crater, Arizona, and Winslow, Arizona, uh, Yucatan, Chicxulub, where the dinosaurs' uh, doom was, was sealed by the giant impactor 66 million years ago. Those uh, impacts occur on every planet, every moon in our solar system. So some asteroid hit the surface of Mars probably millions of years ago, ejected material, low gravity on Mars, low atmosphere, uh, and that material has been orbiting around and eventually made its way and hit the Earth. Okay, so matter from Mars landed on the Earth. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That's how I gave you – I have a lunar meteorite that I'm giving to you, again, as a, as, a, as a token of my appreciation for all you do. That came the same way. Something hit the moon, blasted off some lunar – it's called breccia. It's the crust of the moon. Eventually made its way, landed in northwest Africa, and I bought a slice of it from a – I got a dealer. You know, I got a meteorite dealer, um, and I uh, got that for you. Okay? Um, so what's the lesson? Material gets exchanged from planet to planet. Now – I asked the following question. If that happened on the Mars to the Earth, the Moon to the Earth, so too has material from the Earth been ejected huh. since life emerged 3.7 billion years ago. There's literally millions of tons of Earth that's floating around in space. Some of that will have landed on Mars. So someday we'll get there, we'll find some piece of it. Now, could it, some of it have a tardigrade on it? Could some of it have a protozoa on it? Obviously it could. Um, and Maybe yet, some interesting... Mic microbes. Yeah, it could. Maybe, maybe some ancient microbes that are no longer That's right. um, extant. So one theory of the formation of life on Earth, you, you asked me about that earlier, the origin of life on Earth is a huge mystery. How did life get here? One proposition was made by Fred Hoyle and other people. It sounds dirty, but it's not. It's called panspermia. It just means that genetic material has been transferred from another, um, another astronomical object landed here on Earth. So uh, the converse reaction occurs as well. 
But the, the, the fact is we don't observe it even on Mars. So if I told you, you know, we've discovered a planet and there's another planet right next to it and it has almost the same conditions. It's in the so-called Goldilocks zone where the temperature is just right to have liquid water, which Mars can have on it at certain times of the year in certain places on Mars. It had flowing water on it. We know for sure Mars had flowing water on it. We know for sure that material from the Earth got there when Earth had life on it. So the absence of life on Mars is a data point. It's not prov probative or provative or it's, it's positive rather that life couldn't exist on Mars. We haven't searched all of Mars. But it, it at least shows that there's an impediment to it. So people are a lot fond of saying, as I told you earlier, there's about 10 to the 24th um, planets probably in our observable universe, going back to the Big Bang, going out to the farthest reaches of the universe. But even if you just take the Milky Way galaxy, there's probably, you know, literally 10 billion, hundreds of billions of planets in our galaxy alone. And um, when you look at that, people like to say, as Carl Sagan did, if there's no life, it's an awful waste of space, right? Why is there so much space and there's no life? It seems incomprehensible. But nature, you know, I love when atheist scientists will say, like, you propose God exists and that's the God of the gaps to explain things that you don't understand. But when science advances, we'll have an explanation for why, you know, thunder occurs. It's not because of Thor, right? We get rid of gods as we learn more. And so the God of the gaps shrinks smaller and smaller. But they'll say the same argument about life in the air. They'll say, well, there's got to be life because there's so much room there. But as I told you, I've been to Antarctica twice. The only life forms I saw there, okay, were people. <laughs> um, I saw a few penguins in the distance and a couple of dead sea lions. There's no trees. There's no flora at all on the entire continent. It's incredibly barren. And yet, Andrew, it makes up 8% of the, of the land mass of the earth. Wow. And you would think, well, if it's just proportional to the amount of area, i.e. the number of stars, there should be 8% of the life on Earth. There should be a billion people there or whatever, you know, 600 million people. No, there's nothing there except for scientists that go there. So the, the odds of life, you know, are you can't construct probability for possibility. That and many, many other arguments that I could give you, the, the, the improbability of life, how hard it is to create life. And, you know, if you just sprinkled, imagine you had a koala cannon, okay? The people at Peter are going to give me, imagine you just go to Mars and spray it with koala. I mean, it's obviously not going to like Well, I start think Peter life, would right? probably be okay with you <laughs> populating with the, an area with koalas. I, I, a cannon to take out koalas, they would probably protest, <laughs> That's right. They would but... not like that. So, yeah, so, uh, you know, Possibility is not probability. Uh, the number number of hurdles to create a, a, a single cell is enormous. Uh, we have yet to reproduce, you know, to make a functional cell in the laboratory. Not that that's a requirement to prove that life could exist elsewhere. I'm just saying it's very hard. Our history of life, we have an N of one. It's very difficult to speculate on. And if we're alone, if there, if life is abundant, as Fermi asked many 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 years ago, um, if life is abundant and the galaxy is is old, where are they? Where are the aliens? There should have been plenty of time, not only for them to evolve and, and be superior to us in many ways and travel the distances of, the, of our, our galaxy, not even of the cosmos, of our galaxy. Where are they? Where are they? They've known about us for 80 years because we've been broadcasting radio waves for the last 85 years. Do you know this theory about the gut microbiota? You know, no. our, our guts, uh, our, our skin, our eyes, right. our nose, but uh, certainly our dig entire digestive tract, um, the whole way down from our lips um, out the other end are populated with these little microbiota right. that influence everything from fatty acid production, neurotransmitter production, et cetera. Influence. It's more than human cells, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and it's powerful for modulating all sorts of biological processes. And um, and every time we interact, shake hands, if people kiss, if you interact with dirt, if you interact with a pet, you <laughs> the, the microbiome changes. It's a ref it's an inner uh, reflection of of all your outer behaviors like and, and internet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then we're learning a lot about it. That there's this one theory that I like that um, kind of turns life as, as you and I know it on its head, which is that um, humans and other species are just vehicles for the microbiome <laughs> that. and that, you know, and, and so you would take something like, Oh, the desire to uh, like, like uh, populate Mars or to shoot uh, or to land on the moon as just the microbiota, you know, taking advantage of this weird old world primate species that we call For homo propulsion. sapiens yeah. that loves to develop technology, almost destroy itself, but then continues to to uh, evolve social media, et cetera. Actually, yeah, Kim Pray there. Warn aren't. each other about declining birth rates. And then just to, to basically the microbiota have a what you know, a sort of quote unquote consciousness, not a brain, but a consciousness of their own, which is like all species to make more of itself and yeah. to go further and further out and populate. It, it's hard to punch holes in the logic of, no. of this of this model, but it, it certainly diminishes our our conscious experience. Um, we could go on forever about uh, this trail. I 
I'll just kind of put a kind of a cliffhanger out there. It'd be wonderful sometime to sit down with you and discuss the possibility of rather than thinking about life elsewhere in the galaxy, given what we know about physics and engineering, astronomy, et cetera, would it be possible to build a planet at the appropriate distance from the sun that we could spawn life by mm. bringing things there as opposed to trying to take it, you know, figure out how to how to do it at a, at a distance that it might not be amenable to life? Right. You know, maybe creating a, a garden planet. Maybe we don't put humans there right away, mm -hmm. um, but trying to create a garden that could thrive at the, some appropriate distance from the sun. Yeah. Um, and no, seeing what... what what nutrients could be grown there? You know, so there, you could have robots man this this planet, but you'd have to somehow aggregate um, stuff in space to build this planet or launch this planet up that it would collect things. I mean, yeah. that to me feels like a fun experiment. Uh, yes, yeah, and I mean, a lot less risky than going <laughs> up up to other planets. Um, yeah, I was uh, I was blessed as my first guest on the Into the Impossible podcast, that Freeman Dyson. Now you mentioned oh, yeah. your dad. Your dad mentioned him. Uh, one of the greatest intellects of the of the last hundred years, great physicist, and he had these ideas for these Dyson spheres, which would be you know, uh, energy harvesting. So the first mm -hmm. you know ingredient that you need to construct the the Huberman you know, planet uh, uh, habitable zone is to have uh, is to have energy. It harvests as much energy as possible from a star. So he he basically conjectured uh, a, a megastructure, an alien megastructure that could be observable by w astronomers could detect these these objects, and and some have claimed that we. Have have, but those have always been refuted. And it would be basically surrounding a star, capturing every photon worth of energy that came out of it, and then converting that to mechanical energy. And then, yes, and then once you have infinite energy, you can actually do fusion. You can make up whatever molecules you want. You could make up, you know, print 3D printing at the, at the quark level on up, basically. And so that was his, you know, conjecture of how super advanced aliens would behave. But again, we have no evidence for it, but it's fun. It's certainly fun to have the science fiction, you know, kind of you know, a lot of interesting science, you know, originates from ideas and creativity that originates from science fiction. So, yeah, it'd be a lot of fun. <laughs>